Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Stack, and I'll be representing Europesh. So the topic of today is the maritime economy and its impact on coastal communities. Well, the maritime economy is very complex, and it has a huge impact on all communities. So it's impossible to single out one sector, since they're all interconnected. So my presentation, therefore, will act as a myth-busting exercise to show how the survival of the fishing sector is essential to the survival of coastal communities. So it's important that we're aware of the facts and disregard the myths. But before we get into that, I'll just explain a little bit about Europesh, for those of you who don't know. So Europesh is the representative body for uh, fishermen and ship owners in the EU. We have 13 members from the main fishing nations. Uh, we represent both large and small, and we're based in Brussels. So just to let, take a look at some of our members. So as you can see, some of our members have more than uh, one organization. So looking at the UK, we have the NFFO, which represents England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We have uh, Shetland Fishermen's uh, Association and the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. So that's kind of a little bit of how uh, Europesh works. So moving on to the first myth, which is small boats are more sustainable than large boats. No is the short answer. Uh, coastal communities need large scale vessels for various reasons. We simply could not feed the growing 7 billion population on small scale alone. Uh, large vessels actually have a significantly lower carbon footprint than small because uh, they don't have uh, multiple trips out to sea like the small-scale vessels. In fact, a recent study uh, highlighted that Shetland's mackerel trawl fishery uh, has a carbon footprint 47 times lower than the beef uh, sector, which is huge, huge difference. Big vessels are able to exploit stocks not accessible to the small scale. So to a large degree, they're interdependent, so they don't really get in each other's way. Uh, in terms of ports, the ports need large-scale vessels because uh, for the reliability and continuity of supply for processing factories and for the local businesses. In terms of safety, international safety conventions are aimed at vessels over 24 metres, so there's actually better health and working conditions on the large-scale vessels. And one of the main reasons why large-scale vessels are large is to able to accommodate the freezing and the storage facilities on board allowing them to go further away and for further uh, longer periods of time. So if you take away this element, the vessels aren't actually that large. Um, all vessels, large and small, are under a strict quota management system, and they're only able to fish within that quota. So it's not a case of large vessels are hoovering up the seas, because they have to fish within their, their strict quota. And so, to sum up, fleet diversity is key here. We should not be pitting one against the other. They work together and they're both as equally important for the survival of coastal communities. So the point is, the point is that we have different types of fishing, different weather conditions, uh, so it's not a case that the big boats are kind of pushing the little ones out of the way. Moving on to the next myth is the EU is subsidising vessels to fish unsustainably. Uh, we have the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, the EMFF, which is around 6 billion euros uh, over a period of six years. And it roughly translates to 2% of the EU's budget for uh, natural resources, I think it's called. And this is compared to 97.5%, which goes to agriculture. So 2% is actually not, a, not so big in the grand scheme of things. So the EMFF, the largest portion, 68%, goes to sustainable fisheries projects, which is like di diversifying activities in coastal communities, pilot projects, and so on. 9% uh, goes to control and enforcement of the CFP. 8% goes to data collection. Actually, data collection is very important in fisheries because they use this to decide how much fish we can catch. So 8% therefore seems quite small. But what's more important than data collection is the processing of data. We actually have a lot of data, but it's not being processed. And unprocessed data is meaningless. And this is all the more important every December council when they're deciding the quotas. For the stocks with, very, with insufficient data, they're automatically cut. The quota is automatically cut by 20% as a precautionary measure. So data is very important. And finally, the 1% uh, goes to the blue economy, which is enabling links with maritime sectors like shipping or uh, mining and so on. So actually this fund is extremely important to the fishing sector. 
We no longer have subsidies to build new vessels. They were phased out years ago. Um, it is true that fishermen can receive money for uh, upgrading vessels, but this is just to make them safer, uh, more fuel efficient, um, so they can use more sustainable fishing gears, and actually to make their vessels safer and uh, better working conditions. Uh, some of the fund also goes to help support the young fishermen enter the sector. I was actually in Aberdeen a few weeks ago, and a lot of the fishermen there have left the sector to go to the more lucrative oil sector. So it's really important that we keep the young people more motivated and keen to join the sector in the first place. So the next myth is uh, most EU stocks are fully exploited. So we've all read the headlines. There's only two cod left in the North Sea and oceans will become deserts by 2020. And whilst most of us, uh, I hope, would choose not to believe everything we read in the press, a lot of this misinformation sticks. So looking at some of the headlines here, the Google Environmental Group, 90% of world fisheries are fully exploited. The Telegraph, 75% world fish stocks fully exploited. BBC, 85% global fish stocks fully exploited. And the fact that they can't make up their mind if it's 90%, 80% is actually beside the point. The statistics been misinterpreted. So... As you can see from this graph from the FAO, from which all the headlines were based, um, the bottom part is under fish stocks, the middle part is fully fish stocks, and the top part is over fish stocks. Um, so if we look at the key at the bottom, you can clearly say, see that the graph states that over 70% of global stocks are fished within biologically sustainable levels. So we have a situation here where the FAO is saying that global fish stocks are fished at, health, fished at healthy levels, yet the communication to the masses is saying the opposite. So fully exploited just means fully fished. That is, they're not underfished, they're not overfished, they're fished within biologically sustainable levels. So this kind of scaremongering and uh, you know, promoting misleading information isn't helping anyone, let alone the sector. So the next myth is F SFPAs contribute to overfishing and are a waste of money. So SFPAs are sustainable fisheries partnership agreements and they're between the EU and third countries and they allow EU vessels to fish in their waters in exchange for money, essentially. So regarding the overfishing part of this statement, um, the agreements are based on the best available science. EU vessels only have access to the surplus uh, that the local communities don't catch. And as a rule, these agreements never authorise EU vessels to fish within 12 miles of the shore to avoid uh, competition with local fishermen. And regarding them being a waste of money, well, we wouldn't enter them if there was no benefit. Um, the EU makes a financial contribution to the third country to help uh, the development of their sector. Um, there's actually an, an obligation for the EU ship owners to hire a portion of the local crew, up to 60% in some agreements, uh, which is quite high. Um, the, the agreements are automatically suspended if human rights are abused, and without them, countries such as China and Russia will swoop in who might not have the same regard for sustainability of stocks. And moving quickly on um, to the next myth, there are too many vessels chasing too few fish. Now, the truth is, in terms of stock management, there's no difference between 10 vessels fishing 1,000 tonnes of fish and two vessels, vessels fishing 1,000 tonnes of fish. Ultimately, the quota of 1,000 tonnes of fish will be taken from the sea. So it makes no difference how many boats are fishing it. Um, there is an argument that uh, vessels that have stopped fishing for whatever reason will receive a subsidy. So less vessels means less subsidy. But actually, this decision to give subsidies in case of bad weather or whatever is taken at the EU level, and then it passes to the member states. So it may not, the member state may even not want to grant this money. And this is the case of many member states. For example, Holland, I know, they don't grant this. And also, fishermen don't want to live off subsidies. This is their, their business. And the final one is trawling is unsustainable. So I often hear people say trawling or even bottom trawling is bad and they would never eat anything caught by a trawl. Um, the word bottom trawling or trawling has become synonymous with unsustainable fishing practices and very unfairly so. All fishing methods are sustainable if they're managed properly. Um, I was actually recently in Delays, a, a Belgian supermarket, and they said that all their fish is caught with Poland line. Um, firstly, I doubt that it's all caught with pearl and line, but secondly, and more importantly, it implies that other fishing methods are not sustainable, which is not the case. EU fishermen comply with some of the strictest rules in the, in the world, 
Trawling is an entirely legal operation in the EU, and it's actually the most widely used operation in the EU. And many of these trawling fisheries are MSC certified as sustainable. So the legislation that we've had over the past few years has demonized other types of fishing methods, uh, seeing blanket bans as the answer. We've had uh, the drift net ban, the deep sea ban, the shark finning ban, and the discard ban. And um, I mean, looking at the drift net ban, it would have wiped out MSC certified fisheries. The shark finning ban has bankrupted the Spanish free freezer fleet. And the implementation of the discard ban will have catastrophic cons consequences for the demersal sector. So blanket bans are never the answer. And fishing practices vary from country to country. So regional legislation is key here, not EU-wide bans. So just to sum up, um, the survival of the fishing sector is the most important factor for the survival of many coastal communities. And in my opinion, the fishing uh, sector are facing the most challenging period in history. Uh, so it's vitally important that the sector themselves highlight the realities of fishing because scaremongering and campaigns could actually signal the end of a European fishing fleet and to a certain extent the end of some local communities. So thank you very much.